Most people would agree that the Pentium 3 was a good processor, even if the K7 usually beat it in benchmarks. Uh, still, why have one CPU when you can have two? Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and as you obviously know by now, we're going to have a look at my dual Pentium 3 workstation. We did have a look at this system before, years ago, but I think we can probably do better now, and if you didn't see that, don't worry, I'm going to be going over everything in this. It's had some upgrades since we saw it last, and, well, as I said, I figured it's worth having another look, especially given it's an earlier board, just how far you can actually push things. Uh, yeah, I don't really have much of anything else to say on that matter, so we might as well just get on with this. So here it is, or it's one of those two machines. It's actually in a different case now. The Pentium 2 has taken the Pentium 3's old case, and the Pentium 3 has moved to one used by the Pentium Pro for a brief time, having been used by an Athlon 1500 before that. A system I think we saw years ago, but, well, it's no longer around because it, it was getting a bit flaky, and I've got a 2800 now. Basically, the only difference between these two cases is that the Pentium 3's one has better ventilation which is needed as this system pukes quite a lot of heat out and the Pentium 2 doesn't. Also their LEDs are a slightly different colour but you're not going to be able to notice that now as well they're switched off. Anyway both of these systems will be working together most of the time so it seems fitting that their cases should mostly match. I think these were made by Chief Tech and I know they were used by a local OEM named Gold in Computer Services. It even still has the resin dome sticker on there, which I'm not going to pull it off and replace it on my own for once. I'll just leave it as it is. <laughs> Jeez, really? You know, if I stop making these videos someday, nobody else is going to have any ideas for their own stuff, are they? Gah. Uh, fun fact about that, Golding used QDI motherboards, and, well, that case the P2 has moved into now, yeah, that's where my original QDI P2 board of the same model came from, along with the original Matrox G100. It's funny how things often seem to come full circle, isn't it? Now, this case had a single Pentium 3 installed in it, which was fine, but now let's pull the lid off and have a look at a real man's Pentium 3 system, or... We will. First, let's briefly check this stuff out. So, drives. Yeah, they're the same as they were. At least the optical drives. They're, there's a slot-loading CD-ROM drive and my first EVD burner from a long, long time ago, back when they used to cost about £370, I think it was. I don't know. I might still have the store's price list from that time. They still work, but they're made in Japan, so that goes without saying. I've said it before... I don't know what the Japanese do to their optical drives, but they sure as hell seem to outlive everything else. Floppy drive is there. It works. It doesn't get much use on a system from this time period unless you're using it for imaging floppies, and I'm not. I use the Chips and Technologies 386 to do that, or the K5. At the back, it might become immediately clear to people who've been around here a long time that this power supply is different. The old one isn't broken, in fact it's running great and well, it's going to run some other system really well, but it wasn't powerful enough anymore for this one. You can make a safe bet that the motherboard is the same, even just by looking at the backplane I.O. shield. The VGA card definitely doesn't look like the old Radeon V either, so that's new. The NIC also wasn't in this particular place before, so things have moved around. There are SP diff sockets, which definitely weren't there before, placed below this. Uh, fun fact, things ended up in this order to dodge potential PCI sharing issues. My board has five slots, but most systems from this time only really support four. With five slots, two of them will share some lines. It may be worth remembering if you're working on such a system and your cards start acting weird. It's not a problem I've had with this machine, but... Well, we're aware of it, and we can avoid it potentially happening, so we may as well. There's also a capture card. This is the one from the Pentium 2, as both systems will be working at the same time, and this one's more powerful. So it makes sense to have it here instead. And, well, the old WinTV Express was really beat up, so here we go. 
Keep in mind, these cards don't really have any encoding on board. It's all done in software by the CPU, so having more power in the system is really going to help. Also, moving it here does open up the Pentium 2 to a different expansion I wanted to install but couldn't before, so maybe that's an option for a later time. This is a win-win situation. The next slot is blank, or, well, it seems that way. There's something suspicious going on over there. Beneath that is, hang on, isn't this that fake Yamaha card? Finally, the lid is off, and we can see that big power supply. Lots of 5 volt power, 50 amps. Unfortunately, not much 12 volt power, so we're up on the limits. This power supply is from an interesting time when Thermaltake was still a top brand and they were making quality stuff, but at the same time, they were on the verge of going to shit overnight, as they did, and making plastic gimmicky crap. The issue is that it's a victim of a rather nasty trend that power supplies were undergoing at the time, which consists of splitting things onto multiple rails of the same voltage. The problem here being that it puts CPU, SATA and PCIe on different rails, where the amp connectors and ATX connector share just one small rail. We're not quite over the limit, but we're close to it than I'd like and things do get a little bit hot. Also, I'm not sure it's entirely good for the supply to have two rails completely unloaded, but that's the way they designed it, so that's the way it's going to have to run. There's not really anything I can do. Going down, and yeah, it's the same motherboard, the Supermicro P6DGU. This seems to be less common than the DBU and other P6DB named boards, which are all made by Supermicro. The B means 440BX chipset, and the G means a 440GX chipset. There were also some boards with SCSI and some without. Mine is a GX board, and it does have SCSI. That's Ultra 2 Wide SCSI. It runs at 80 megabytes per second maximum. So what's special about the 440GX chipset itself? Well, it's basically the same as the 440BX, a chipset that most anyone will agree was absolutely brilliant. They were very popular for a reason. They just fucking work. The most notable differences with the GX are that it supports double the amount of RAM and it has support for Xeon processors. We won't be running those in here, as those are slot 2 CPUs and this board is slot 1. We do have the maximum amount of RAM installed though, 2 gigabytes. This is Kingston RAM. It's the same RAM we had in here before. We can't upgrade it any farther, and being Kingston, it's not going to break, so, well, there was no real reason to change it. The motherboard though, it just oozes awesome. This thing is easily quality. You can just tell by looking at it. Even the solder work on it looks far better than a run-of-the-mill board. When you buy a motherboard like this, it's probably going to cost you the same, if not more, than a gaming board. Yeah, it doesn't look all flashy like those, so you have to wonder where the money's going. You get what you pay for. These boards are much better made. They'll last you a lot longer, even if they won't perform quite as fast necessarily, because they're focused on reliability. Also, did I mention it was made in the USA? And yeah, that's probably a large part of why it still works so well. I doubt China could match this at the moment, maybe someday. Although Taiwan might be able to give it a good contest, where Supermicro's rival Taiyan comes from. I still think the Supermicro boards would win bigly overall though, and they're my favourite, so I'm even running a Supermicro board, the X10 SAE, in my current Xeon E3 workstation. I'm sure you've noticed these by now, so here, these CPUs are definitely not the same as they were before. The system started out on just a pair of 500MHz Katmai chips, some of the earliest Pentium 3 processors. It was upgraded to a pair of 1GHz SL4BS chips with a copper mine core, but they were for a 133MHz GTL front side bus, and my board doesn't like doing that. Been rated only for 100MHz, and running into troubles with the SCSI controller Nick if pushed farther which you can do using this little menu in the BIOS if you're curious, but I don't recommend it as I've heard of these 440 chipsets just outright failing for no apparent reason if you start overclocking them for long periods of time, and I'd rather not kill this motherboard. But this issue did leave us sitting at 750MHz most of the time on those CPUs, which wasn't as much of an upgrade as it might have been. In fact, it was half the upgrade it might have been. 
Well, now allow me to introduce you to the Intel SL5QW. Actually, make that two of them. They're siblings, probably even twins. They're double teaming the same motherboard. Yeah, it sounds like fun to me. Joking aside, these processors do run on a 100 MHz bus and are, in fact, the fastest Pentium 3 processors to do so, operating at 1.1 GHz. They seem to be quite rare, but at the same time, they don't seem to cost that much when they show up, or they didn't. I guess a larger channel hasn't done a video on them yet, or hadn't when I bought these, but that was a couple of years ago and things could really have changed by now. Anyway, good luck getting hold of one, or two. There were some Tualatin Celeron chips that ran faster on a 100 MHz bus, but those are rare and boards which support them probably aren't easy to find. We can't even use them in here anyway because the Celeron doesn't support SMP, which means we'd be stuck with only one CPU, which, well, that just seems pointless when we've got a motherboard that can take two of them. The Airbit BP6 is probably the only one you'd be able to get to do that sort of thing with Celerons, and you'd have to modify it, I would think, to take the Tualatin chips. We'd also have to mess around patching microcodes into the BIOS, which is a complete pain, and the gains would probably be small, if anything. Obviously, these 1.1 GHz copper mine chips are Socket 370 only. There was no Slot 1 version of this particular model, as far as I can tell, and my board is a slot 1, so adapters are needed. The PowerLeap P3 SMPT slockets are specially designed for dual CPU systems, and they do support to Allerton chips, and I even have some of those at 1.4 GHz with 512k cache, but they don't seem like the right upgrade path for this system, and are a chore to work with anyway. We're much better on copper mine CPUs on this occasion, in my opinion. Plus the fact these are probably more accurate. You've got to remember that the faster Pentium 3 S Tualatins weren't available at retail. Intel made them scarcely available simply so they didn't eat into sales of the early Pentium 4s, which were completely abysmal processors. That does really only apply to early Pentium 4s. The later Pentium 4s were actually pretty good. They even managed to turn the tables, as far as I'm aware. Certainly seemed that way to me. Yeah, this motherboard's from 1998, by the way. I thought I'd just point that out. Yeah, I think 1.1 GHz times 2 is good enough, then, all things considered. Good luck finding these particular slockets. This was a case of just being in the right place at the right time a few years ago. Also, the coolers for them. I need to put those back on, because they work better than these aluminum ones, probably as they have more space to pull air into the fans and the fans run a lot faster. Plus, one of these aluminum ones is on loan from my K6, and it needs to go home, because I can't use that thing right now. So, yeah, don't be surprised if some of the shots in this video randomly show these slockets with the low-profile copper heatsinks on instead, as I'm going to change them over while the case is open, and, well, it kind of gives you an idea of filming order, I guess. My video card is now an NVIDIA Quadro 2 Pro. This is essentially a high-end GeForce 2 GPU, but with a slightly different configuration. The short version of that being that it was binned from a more stringent quality control line, and it leans farther towards rendering quality and accuracy than it does speed, the opposite of gaming-oriented GeForce 2 cards. You can actually modify and flash the card to run as a GeForce 2 Ultra, or something like that. I can't really remember what it's an equivalent to now. It's sort of between two different models. I've no interest in doing that, though, so I won't be doing that. I'm just going to leave it alone, because it works great as it is. I've had no problems with it, and yeah, there's no point in fixing what isn't broken, really. Honestly, this card is probably overkill, but it was really cheap, because a heatsink had fallen off the memory, and it was sold as broken. Nothing a little bit of cleaning, silver thermal paste, and heatsink glue couldn't fix in a jiffy, really. Run the card upside down for a few hours, the glue set. Yeah, I'd consider that a win, personally. The nick below is a trusty 3COM 3C905. It does its job. 
Yeah, this one's actually kind of interesting because it has a wake on LAN cable attached. What happens is that the NIC is left running when the system powers down. It draws power from the 5 volt standby rail on the power supply. This rail is always active as long as the power cord's plugged into the back of the unit and it's what runs the soft power switch circuitry on ATX systems. You can see where this is going. The NIC basically signals that circuit when it receives a magic packet and it turns the system on. It was very good for scheduling things in businesses as, well, you could save on electricity. You didn't have to leave the machine running when you left, but it could be woken up in the night and left to do whatever chores you had, backups or, or replication of some information across the network. I don't know. Never really ran into anything running that way. Businesses seemed quite happy to just leave things turned on all the time. Work on modem worked in a similar way. Call the modem and the system would start. We don't have that in here because there's no modem. But anyway, yeah, they, these work on LAN, work on modem cables, they're not really anything special, but you rarely see them in use, so I figured that was a novel thing was worth pointing out, because, like I say, you just never really see those connected. The SP diff sockets go off to the sound card, that's it. There's really nothing behind them other than a, a cable. We already know the caps card is a generic BT878. It is a Win TV, but I can't remember exactly which model. I'm using a third party driver with it anyway. It also does connect internally to the sound card by that header I added. Apparently, it can also do FM radio. I don't listen to the radio. That blank slot is not blank. What a peculiar card this is. It has 2 megabytes of EDO installed. And yeah, that is ECC EDO or BEDO, something along those lines. It also has a header for an LED. It's made by Adeptech, and it seems to have at least three different model numbers assigned to it. You know, if I didn't know better, I'd say it was a SCSI card, but, well, there's nowhere to plug in a hard drive. So what we have here is an Arrow 1130U2. It's a zero-channel SCSI card for RAID port 3 which some motherboard supported, like this one. What happens is the card plugs into a PCI slot like normal, but it also plugs into this little RAID port slot behind it. From there, it overrides the SCSI bias provided in the motherboard's own EEPROM and adds RAID features to the onboard SCSI using its own bias. If you ever have one of these cards and it doesn't work, you might need to use the oddly named array selection tools to flash the correct bias to the card as it appears to vary by motherboard vendor and naturally with which SCSI controller your motherboard is using. You probably won't see one around there as they're not that useful anymore and I don't think they were that popular. I've never seen one in use. Sure, it is neat to upgrade the onboard SCSI this way, but by now the cost savings that may have existed, and I'm sceptical they ever did, are probably negated, and it uses up a PCI slot anyway. You could just as easily disable the internal SCSI and install a faster card, such as a two-channel Ultra 160 SCSI controller. Would probably be better. You could even go further. Why not go for Ultra 320? But there's not much point when you're on regular PCI. You would to go beyond Ultra 160, and even that's pushing it. You're really going to need PCI X or something, which we don't have here. The onboard SCSI only provides one 80 megabytes per second Ultra 2 channel and two slower interfaces, meaning we're running RAID on only a single SCSI channel, which isn't as fast. It does work, though. The RAID array itself, in this case, is provided by four 36GB Hitachi 10K drives in a RAID 10 configuration, providing a 72GB volume, which is mirrored in case of a drive failure. In an ideal world, you would have two SCSI channels with two drives on each. One side of the stripe would be on channel 0, and the other side of the stripe would be on channel 1, and then obviously the mirrors of the stripe would be the same. This would gain you twice the speed. This is how parallel RAID worked if you were really serious about it. Same with IDE, if you were using a, a real IDE RAID card and not those cheap Chinese ones you bought from Maplin Electronics, each port only supported one drive. Every drive had its own channel. That's how you're supposed to do parallel RAID. 
As it happens, the drives I'm using are rated for Ultra 160 SCSI, and so on this controller, in this configuration, we're just going to get a pretty consistent max speed, no matter what we throw at them, because the controller's a bottleneck. Everything else here can go a lot faster. The PCI bus can go faster, and the drives can go faster. I'm unlikely to upgrade anything, as that speed is more than I'm ever going to need on here. It's putting far less stress on the hard drive, so they'll probably last longer, and also, because it's limited to 80 megabytes per second, in reality about 76, 77 constantly, there is no variation at all, it's, it's just constant. It's not going to saturate my PCI bus, which obviously goes significantly faster than that. This is expensive though, it's going to use at least four hard drives. You can use more than four hard drives if you want to, and it's going to start running up a bill and using a lot of power and becoming somewhat impractical if you don't really need it. But, hey, if you've got the resources to do it, go for it, because it's cool. Now, this whole setup isn't a license not to make backups anymore. Mirroring might save you from a drive failure, but it won't save you from theft of the system, or a, a fire in the office building, or... Hell, if you write corrupted data to the drives, the RAID controller has no way to know that that data's bad, it's just doing as it's told. It's going to mirror that as well, and well, now you've wrecked both copies. This is why you should always have offline backups of things that are mission critical. There are other RAID configurations around, such as RAID 5, which uses a single parity drive instead of using two for mirroring a stripe. Nobody in their right mind would use that for anything important, though. It's not really as reliable. In fact, it's far less reliable. I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. I'd rather just spend the extra cost and do things properly and make offline backups. And I'm not going to be an asshole. I will let you hear these spin up soon because I'm sure you want to just as much as I do. But on the subject of noises, the sound card we've already seen. In fact, I'm going to be lazy and just reuse footage from the last video. Why not? Yeah, I know it's a piece of shit, this sound card, but in striking contrast to its terrible outputs, it has a very clean line input. In fact, the noise floor is lower than the meter in Audacity would go. I had to use an older program like SoundForge 4 to see where it is. It's kind of interesting how none of the modern recording applications go that low. It's almost like you think modern sound cards are noisy and they just think it's not worth it. Which, yeah, I've actually found is the case. You might remember my complaints about the very limited SPDIF options on this card. Well, by happy coincidence, this makes it ideal for use with my Akai S3200 sampler. You see, I want to record my music with this thing, and I also want to use it for getting sounds into my sampler. The problem being that if I hook the output of this system to my sampler, and then hook the output of my mixer up to the input of this system, it's going to create an infinite loop as soon as I go into record mode on the sampler unless I play with either the Windows volume mixer or my actual mixer or the sampler's volume settings. Something I don't want to do because it's a chore to keep turning knobs and trying to get levels right on everything. I'd rather just leave them alone once they're set correctly. And, well, by pure chance, this sound card can't output analog inputs to the SPDIF port, so all I have to do is hook the sampler up to the digital output on this card, flip the switch in the Yamaha control panel, no need to modify mixer settings, no infinite loop. I simply flick it back once I'm done getting noises into the sampler. Yay, now a Eureka, and everything works great. It's a happy accident, but it's a damn good one. Who would have thought this thing would actually be useful? Of course, the Pentium 2 will be doing MIDI control here. This system's just handling the actual audio side of things. These two systems, combined with a switch box and their second small monitor to have SoundForge running on, so I can see what's going on on both systems at once, well, I can run both systems at once from just this one place and work on music without having to trail wires across the other side of the room or resort to silly needless faffing around with machinery in the middle of the floor and all sorts of crap just to get shit done. Anyway, let's hear that raid array spin up. Well, it's going to take a while to get there. You see, these server and workstation boards usually take a long time to post, even with quick boot options enabled in the BIOS. But that's a good thing, at least we know for sure it's working, and 
Well, you probably aren't going to turn it off that option. It's going to work long hours. As you can see, the arrow card's bias takes over and... What was that? Sorry, I couldn't hear you over how awesome my workstation was being. Uh, yeah, there's just something satisfying about hearing a bunch of 10k drives in staggered spin-up. It's, it's like music. Once we get past this, the system boots very quickly, or as fast as XP could probably ever start. I swear, for half of the time, there's no drive activity, no matter what system you're running on. It wasn't much quicker than this on the Pentium D, and the drives on there could shift about 400 megabytes per second. I've no idea what XP is doing in this time, and Win2K is just as bad. It just sits there and does nothing. Why? Still, that's fast enough, given that this is basically a 1998 system at its heart. Yeah, I'd say it's doing alright. So... Benchmarks, they're obligatory, right? 3D Mark 2001, it's a bit late for this video card. This little Quadra 2 doesn't do too bad, especially considering that, well, 3D Mark's probably a gaming-oriented benchmark, and this card isn't really gaming-oriented. It does really well in 3D Mark 2000, I think it does anyway. I've nothing to compare it with because the Athlon can't run this for whatever reason, it just stutters. And when I say stutters, I mean one frame a minute. Yeah, there'll always be something that that machine just can't run, and I've tweaked it to a point where it's running all of the games I want it to, so I'm not messing with it again. I'm sorry. This Pentium 3 runs it, that's the only result we've got. Both machines can run past Mark 7, though. Well, shit, that poor Athlon XP just got its ass handed to it pretty hard. That is a 2800, by the way. Um, yeah, uh, hmm. We can also see quite clearly how much of an improvement DDR running at more than twice the clock speed offers over SD RAM. Though the gap isn't really as large as the memory vendors back then would have made out to you in all the literature. All things considered, this system does hold its own very well, though. I mean, as I say, going by the motherboard, there's about a five-year gap between them, so it's quite impressive. And I know you're thinking this thing's about maxed out, but let's be honest, there's not really much more realistic upgrade path for that AMD K7 system either, and if we start upgrading video cards in there to ridiculously late ones that aren't really appropriate for the system, there's nothing to stop us doing it in here. This thing will run crisis if you fiddle with the hardware enough, and it won't actually run that badly. There are people on YouTube who've done that, so well, I'm not going to start buying cards and stuff just to demonstrate it. There are plenty of demonstrations of people doing things like that with these. Unfortunately, I've no way to run the regular DOS benchmarks on here without seriously tampering with things that I just don't have the resources to do and honestly have no desire to really investigate. We would be stuck with only one CPU anyway, as DOS doesn't know how to use more than one at the same time. It doesn't even really do multi-threading DOS. I'm sure we will have a chance to play with a regular, single-processor Pentium 3 someday, so we can have a look into that kind of thing then. In fact, I think I have just the idea. No games either, I don't intend to play those on here. In fact, I don't really own any games from this time period. Mostly because they're boring, they're only good at LAN parties, and there aren't any LAN parties left around here that are worth bloody going to. So fuck that. I suppose we could probably run much of the same games the Athlon does, unless they require DirectX 8. This thing would probably do pretty well, but a lot of them weren't multiprocessor aware yet, so there's just no point. The Athlon's going to far better at that kind of thing, because it's got one big powerful thread instead of two smaller ones, and yeah, g games are just going to run better on that Athlon. That's why the Athlon's for games, and this thing's for work. Now you're probably thinking, ah, oh, just run Quake 3 Arena, everyone else does. My machines just white screen me on it for some reason. I, I 
don't know why. They'll either do that or have other problems. It's always been this way. I just cannot build a machine that will run Quake 3 Arena. It, it, it has to be the way I build them or set them up or something. Even the Pentium D could never run games on that engine. Notably, the original Call of Duty ran like shit on it. And by that, I mean you were lucky to get more than three frames a second and the textures used to bug out. I honestly have no idea, and I dirt car because I don't like either of those games, so fuck it. I'm not fixing this machine to run something that it's never going to run. It's set up the way I want it, it's doing what I want it to do. So, yeah, more importantly, this thing kicks ass at music production stuff and Sony Vegas, which is what I want to do with it. And anyway, we know it should be able to do this because it kept the YouTube channel going for quite a while when the Core 2 was been a piece of shit. As in, the whole time the Core 2 existed, because Core 2s are a piece of shit. Which is ironic, given that they're based on this same fucking processor architecture as this thing. I don't know what they broke, but those things are terrible. And I never want to go near another one. In fact, I will put my boot through it if you put me in the same room as a Core 2 system. Still, if this thing can do 720p video, then it can sure as hell do music. The cool thing is that if I want to work really fast, I can just leave Vegas rendering or something on only one thread, and then keep messing about with SoundForge on the other CPU, completely lag-free. Hard drives are fast enough to not really give a shit, and, well, the, the whole system isn't going to give a damn. It's just going to breeze through it without a problem. Absolutely not worried here at all. This thing should perform just brilliantly in this field. I suppose we should hear a quick test of something. We'll do a cover of a song from Nightmare 3D, sequenced on the Pentium 2, rendered with my synthesizers, and then recorded and edited on this Pentium 3. In fact, due to the capture card, we could probably produce an entire album and accompanying music videos with just these two machines pretty decently. Nonetheless, here's that music. So there we are, that's this machine. We can't really upgrade it any further aside from maybe a faster SCSI card, but I don't need and probably won't bother with because, as I said, this way I can't really load the hard drives too hard so they should last longer and run cooler, and also I can't saturate my PCI bus as we're only using about half of the bandwidth it has, which leaves plenty of room for my network card, my sound card, and the TV card and everything to basically hammer it and have absolutely no effect. This thing's a really capable machine. As it stands now, it's running absolutely splendidly and I've no intentions of tampering with it whatsoever. It's doing its job, it's doing its job perfectly, and I think it's probably going to stay that way for a long time. And that's that. So. Yeah, it's a very good machine. I, I can't see it going away anytime soon. It's, it's doing its job absolutely brilliantly, and, well, I've got plenty of things for it to do in that regard. So, yeah, it, it probably is worth mentioning. I actually did have trouble getting it going. It was... Basically, when I, I moved here, it wasn't in the best of shape. It had some sort of... Hardware had gone a bit bad. Hard drives, I thought. And what happened, it turns out, there was an oxide layer on absolutely everything, and it's taken a long time to get it out of that. It was on the heat sinks even, just everything oxidized, and I don't understand why, because it's been stored in the same place as other machines that are absolutely fine, so I'm not sure what that's about. The other thing is that it just wouldn't start up again, and it's always done that, this board. If you mess with the hardware configuration, it won't start, and you can spend hours resetting the BIOS, pulling things out, putting things in, and it just won't start up. And then you walk away for a while, it'll switch back on when you try again, as if nothing was ever wrong, and as long as you don't mess with it, it'll just run forever quite happily, and I don't know what that's about. I've never been able to figure it out. It's probably something small I'm missing, but like I said, once you've got it all hooked up and running, 
it'll just never break again, so it's just a quark of the system. It seems harmless enough as long as we don't upset it. Now, probably somebody's thinking, oh god, Windows XP, you should be running Windows 2000 or something. I'd like to run Windows 2000, that, that was what I originally did. There's no point dual booting Win9X, it's just it's not going to take advantage of the dual CPUs and by this point well we might as well use an Athlon if we're going to do Windows 98 and well incidentally my Athlon runs Windows 98 and it runs it very well in fact in that regard it will probably run it faster than this thing even though this is going to benchmark faster in Passmark or whatever it doesn't really matter the Athlon's going to be faster in Windows 98 because it's a single processor and that's all Windows 98 can really use at any given time so yeah different systems for different purposes so yeah Windows 2000 I, I did try it but I had to mess with so many updates and patches and it got very precarious just to run things that I wanted to run and it the performance penalty for running Windows XP is really small, like it's absolutely tiny. There's just no reason to have any concern about it that I can think of. I think it's like 1% or something that we're losing in performance by running XP, if that. So, yeah, we don't have to install a bunch of updates and stuff that would have probably brought Windows 2000 down to that level anyway. Things will just run, so it's the obvious choice and it's not really out of place I mean clearly with the CPUs we're running and that video card it would be a case of a feasible upgrade path you know in reality if you were running the system when it was relevant you might well have upgraded the CPUs and the video card and such like this and upgraded the operating system it's a thing people do so I don't think we're really doing anything wrong it's what works the machine is here to do a job and it's going to do it better this way. But you can argue the toss if you want to, that's fine by me. Anyway, I, I don't think I have anything else to say about it, really, not today. We, we may see it again at some point, and uh, who knows. I, I do have other things on the cards. I've sort of been trying to mend a, another workstation of mine. You probably know it. I'm, I'm trying to fix my Pentium D, because, uh, yeah, it, it's sort of... Uh, wasn't running so great. I, I've made some changes to the hardware. I, I could probably get the existing hardware to run again. I, I've sort of messed with it and I can get it to start but it's not happy and I'm like well it's a museum piece now. We might as well just change bits out. It, it doesn't matter. You know so well we may see that someday but that's probably some ways away. So yeah I'm not sure what's next on the list but we'll get there. Anyway you get the point. I'm, I'm high treason Thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw up, load DOS 622 up. You know, I've no idea what I've done. Like, my tripod just won't fit here at like its higher position anymore. I must have moved something. I'm going to have to figure that out. It's, it's as if my keyboard stands closer this way than it was or something. So yeah, we're back at this I'm looking down at you angle that I don't really want. But hell, you know, I guess as per the YouTube terminology, you're the subs. And that makes me the dom. So yeah. <laughs> hey, th that's what the site says. So yeah, if I'm the dom... And what on earth do you think you're doing, you filthy thing? I'm going to make you clean my feet with your tongue. Well, here's a thing that's probably worth mentioning. This connector here, this motherboard you may have noticed, uses it to power the RAM. And it needs it because the ATX connector has pretty much been sat dry by the CPUs. Now, with these power leap adapters we're using, there might actually be enough power left over as well. They have their own independent power supply. But that depends how you've wired them, and in my case, they're just leeching the ATX power connector anyway, so we still need this. But I've heard people referring to it as an AT power connector, and it, it honestly isn't. It's uh, I've heard it go by various names, you know, the P4 connector, the P10 or something, I can't remember, the P4 connector, but... I always just knew it as an AUX connector, and that's what it is, it's auxiliary power. It just has 5 volts, 
3 volts and obviously ground it's just additional power, it used to be on old dual processor motherboards and some early Pentium 4 boards I can see why you'd call it an AT connector though, it is the same connector type different pinout, it resembles a third AT connector that some systems had which gave 3.3 volts to the PCI slots, which was usually on Intel motherboards but hell, you know, you can call it what you will I guess we know what it does at least, that's what matters but to me it was always an AUGS connector because, well, like I said, that's what it is. Auxiliary power for boards that need it.